I hope you can hear me. Speak loudly, okay. Welcome, it's such a pleasure to be here today and be back in this historic room uh, for our Lisa Krivikas Grand Rounds series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sabrina Paganoni and I, I am an ALS researcher in the NGH ALS group. Uh, and I would like to welcome everyone who's here in person as well as, as those of you who are here online. So who was Lisa Krivikas? Well, I want to start by introducing why this Grand Round series is so special to me and to many in the audience I see here. Lisa Krivikas was uh, an ALS researcher, uh, an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Spalding Hospital and NGH. Uh, and I met her when I was a resident in 2008. Uh, she was a great teacher and all the residents were drawn to her, including myself. So I asked her to mentor me uh, and little did I know that that encounter would change uh, my career. So uh, a few months after I met her, she gave a very powerful Grand Rounds lecture uh, where she announced that her ALS research had become personal. She herself had developed ALS. In fact, she died one year later before I finished my residency. But before then, she continued to mentor me and she encouraged me to continue her work as a physiatrist in ALS. And so she introduced me to Merit Sukovic, who is here, the chair of our department, and she encouraged me to, to work with her. In fact, she encouraged me to do a research elective as a resident in the NGH group. So at the time, uh, there were a few residents there. There was also a fellow named Dr. James Berry, who was there. <laughs> Uh, and he was starting his career in ALS research and later became a great mentor, colleague, and friend. Uh, and so, as, as, you know, as we continue to honor the legacy of Dr. Krivikas, I want to, uh, to say a few words about uh, what, her, um, what she wanted to do. She wanted to do something meaningful to change the course of ALS. And while we don't have a cure yet, we certainly have had a lot of progress, especially in the last year, with two new approved drugs for ALS. There's also one drug that's up for approval in 2023 for genetic forms of ALS, which is so important. And so uh, a person who has been at the center of all of this, in addition to Dr. Sukovic, is Dr. Barry, who is our speaker today, who has, had, who has made seminar contributions to the field of ALS, has been involved in many programs that are connected in different ways to drug approvals for ALS, and has really been at the front, forefront of ALS research. So let me read a couple of things about Dr. Barry. He's the chief of uh, the division of ALS and motor neuron diseases. I'm sorry, I have to read it because there's so many titles and so many accomplishments. I, I, just, I just need to remember the, the main ones. He's also the Winthrop Family Scholar in ALS Sciences. Is uh, the Averill Healy Endowed Chair in ALS. Is uh, the director of the Neurological Clinical Research Institute. And among his many accomplishments, Dr. Barry is an international leader in ALS biomarker development and clinical trial methodology. So there are many things that I admire about James and, and you can read his, the rest of his bio in the program. But the one thing that I would like to highlight today uh, and that I really admire is that he's a visionary leader. He's the one who sees where things are going before everyone else does. And that's reflected in the title of his talk today, which is really a forward thinking talk. Today we'll be talking about digitizing ALS using digital data to quantify behavior and function in ALS and hasten drug development. Before we give the podium to Dr. Barry, I would like to present him with a plaque to honor again this, um, Dr. Krivika's legacy and these lectures. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. A little technical issue. All right. Um, thank you all for being here, Sabrina. Thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. It is really an honor to give the Lisa Kravikis lecture um, and to hopefully honor her legacy of mentoring, of teaching, of, of research, and of clinical care. And, you know, really at the Healy Center and the NCRI, we are doing so much work. There's so much going on that just to select the topic um, was, was somewhat difficult. Um, but I wanted to talk about something that really spins out of a fairly simple question, which I remember was, I really started toying with primarily, I remember walking away from one of our ice bucket challenge events 
And, and this question was sort of on my mind, burning on my mind. And um, I ran into a, an old colleague who uh, was in psychiatry, but we had been residents together. And, and we started talking about what if we could use digital devices to quantify people's function, hasten drug discovery, and reduce trial burden for people with ALS and other neurological diseases. And that was sort of the genesis of a very simple question that spawns really all the work that, that I'll be talking about today. It's a little bit out there as a question, but then I sort of thought, well, you know what, in cardiology, we've been doing this with Fulter monitors and King of Hearts monitors and all the monitors that have spun out of that for a very long time. And it's really not that big a leap to say, we'd like to do this for bulbar function and strength and respiratory function in ALS. And so it went from sort of a big kind of out there question to actually just an iterative question, but one that I think is really important. These are my disclosures. I, try, I do try to be involved in um, you know, many of the projects that are going on in ALS. Because this is sort of couched in ALS, I'll say a few words about, about the disease that I think will be important to frame uh, the rest of the talk. It's caused primarily, though not exclusively, by a loss of motor neurons in the brain and the spinal cord. Certainly there are other, motor, pardon me, other neurons that are affected, which is why 5% of people develop FTD, and many of the supporting cells like microglia are affected as well. The classic clinical tagline is a progressive painless weakness. And I'll just pause to say that at the, at the outset of the disease, this is, this is a good description, but um, people with ALS often bristle at this because pain does become a part of the disease for a variety of reasons, immobility, um, spasticity, injury. Um, and so we wanna be cautious about how we think about that. It can start in any region, the bulbar region, cervical and lumbar region are about equally represented for the onset of the disease. and then one to three percent of the time it starts as a respiratory disease and the average survival after symptom onset is three to five years however there's a wide variability with 10 percent of people living longer than 10 years and, and some people succumbing much faster to the disease and that variability is both troublesome as we do research but also i think something that we can learn from there's a diagnostic delay that is about 12 months past from the time that symptoms start until people get a diagnosis on average and this is actually remarkably similar around the globe and over time, and it's something that we'd like to make progress on, and I'll touch on that in a sort of, uh, in a way later in the talk. As, as Sabrina mentioned, we have three FDA-approved disease-modifying medications, really is all Adaravonet, sodium phenylbutyrate, Terso, um, and, and we have myriad symptomatic uh, therapies as well. But in addition, we have a very full pipeline for clinical trials. In fact, so full that doing traditional design clinical trials is really not going to serve us. We need to test things faster, which is leading to in innovative trial designs. And I'll, I'll touch on that as well. But just to give you a sense of how disease-modifying therapy discovery is hastening over time, up until 1995, there were no approved uh, disease-modifying therapies. We had really is all approved in 1995. It's an anti-excited toxic medication in a very general sense, leads to about 10% slowing of the disease. And then we had a long pause in terms of, of approvals until Adaravon, an antioxidant, at least in theory, um, showed 30% slowing in one of two trials and, and gained approval by the FDA in 2017. Now, this is an IV formulation taken 10 days out of the month. And um, it was no small breakthrough then to have oral Adaravon approved in 2022. Also in 2022, in a trial led by Sabrina Paganoni, um, sodium phenylbutyrate and terso uh, in combination was shown to have a 25% slowing in function, 25% slowing of function decline, as well as a survival benefit. And there's a, a global phase three trial ongoing, not in the US anymore because of the approval. But you see how these dots begin to sort of pile on top of one another. And as Sabrina mentioned in, in her introduction, tofersin, which is an intrathecal antisensor oligonucleotide for SOD1 ALS, um, is in front of the FDA now. And it has been shown to reduce SOD1 to reduce neurofilament light uh, and to slow disease, though it missed its primary endpoint in the randomized controlled trial, secondary endpoints were positive and um, there was a slowing of disease in the open label extension. So we're hopeful as a community about that. And not only that, but there are many, many ongoing clinical trials more than ever before. And so, um, you know, we are looking forward to this continued pace of discovery. It's in that setting that Merritt uh, started the the Healy ALS platform trial, and she is the PI, Sabrina is the co-PI of this, and really our whole organization is contributing to this. It's, it's very um, complex, but it's also really moving us towards answers faster. And so we've completed um, four regimens, we've released results on three of those regimens, a fifth is enrolling now, and we have six and seven lined up and others for design phase after that. There are efficiencies to this in terms of how we do startup, how we interact with sites, how we enroll participants, and we reduce the placebo burden. But this trial, like other trials, 
really rely on traditional ALS outcome measures. The revised ALS functional rating scale is a questionnaire, not unlike the UPDRS and Parkinson's disease. It has 12 items. It's delivered by a trained examiner in clinic or over the phone. And then the, the participants' answers are interpreted uh, and, and um, scored. It has a respiratory subdomain, a bulbar subdomain, a gross motor subdomain, and a fine motor subdomain. And this is really the workhorse of our clinical trials. It, it really takes on the importance of the modified Rankin scale for stroke. It is sort of a primary endpoint across the board, basically. We do have also secondary endpoints like vital capacity, which measures strength of the muscles of respiration, quantitative motor strength testing, and survival. Survival is obviously a very key endpoint, but we try to do trials that are shorter. So over six months, it's very difficult to have statistical power to look at survival as the primary endpoint. This sort of leaves room for improvement. I wanna just take a, a little look at the ALS functional rating scale. Um, these are the subdomains and the questions within it. So in the bulbar region, we're looking at quantification of speech, of salivation, of swallowing, fine motor is handwriting, cutting food, dressing and hygiene, gross motor is turning in bed, walking and climbing stairs. And in the respiratory section, there are questions about dyspnea, orthopnea, and use of BiPAP. Now, this was really designed from a clinical perspective. These are really some of the key things that we ask about in, in clinic, and it captures many of the, of the, of the parts of the disease really, uh, really well. It's quite interpretable when we look at kind of the, the domains that we're covering. However, it wasn't really, pardon me, it wasn't really designed as a psychometric tool in the way that we think about it now. So rash analysis shows that the items overlap, that the item weighting, item weighting is not uniform, and that the scale is not unidimensional. These are all things that we would look for in a sort of a, a well-designed psychometrically sound tool these days. Having said that, it, it actually performs remarkably well for a scale that, that looks this uh, sort of out of bounds for, for a rash analysis. Um, so I don't, I will not be saying throughout this, this uh, talk at all that we should be throwing the ALS FRSR aside, but rather we should find new ways to look at it and ways to supplement it. One other thing about the ALS FRSR is that its progression is treated as linear, but actually it's, it's more complex. So this is a, a figure that comes from a paper from Divya Lomamorthy, uh, a, post, uh, a doctoral student at MIT. And it shows not only is it not a linear decline, but actually we can cluster people by different, different shapes of decline. One thing I would point you to here, though, is that this tells us something about the disease and the, the interaction of the scale and the disease, but the time course here is over three years, and I just told you that we try to do six-month studies, and so if we pick out almost any six-month epoch in this, it actually is declining in a fairly linear way, so um, I don't think we want to be too hard on our scales that exist now, but there are opportunities to analyze the data we have differently and analyze different data, so there are many additional scales some are covering similar topics to ALS FSR, and some are, are covering important unmeasured impacts of ALS. And I think we have an opportunity to look at those. And we also live in this very data-rich world, and we should take advantage of that. Um, and I think there are ways that we can do that that we've really left on the table. Some that I talk about today are fairly well mature. Some are um, more exploratory. But digital biomarkers present this opportunity to quantify function, to gather big data, they can be simple to do, simple to include in trials, and they can facilitate those trials if we do them right. They can also inform care. I have to say that my perspective today, especially for today's conversation, but really in what I do, I'm framing things through the eyes of a clinical trialist. So digital outcome measures um, sort of are, are, at a, are, are at sort of a certain standing in ALS. That is researchers, people with ALS, and you'll see this abbreviated as PALS throughout the, throughout the, the talk, and regulators would like to move toward digital outcome measures and trials. The goal being, I think from every, everybody's perspective, faster trials, less burden, and, and something that's more reflective of real life impact. But we also don't wanna run into this naively. In order to be worth adopting, these outcome measures have to do something better than we're doing currently. It may be that they get us to an answer more quickly, that they are more reflective of real life. Um, it might be that they're easier to administer, um, or they give us a broader, a, a broader view of things, but they have to do something better than what we're doing in order for us to adopt them. If we do find that, then there are a few steps we need to go through to adopt these digital outcomes. We have to gather data to show that they're useful, and we have to feel comfortable about usability and compliance, and that's, not, that's no small bar in some ways, and I'll show you some data about that. We have to understand their change over time. So there's, I think, an inclination many times to say, oh, look, we can separate ALS from, from healthy volunteers, isn't that a great scale? But we really need to look over time in order to adopt it, though cross-sectional analysis is a good first step. And finally, there are regulatory considerations. And I think there are groups like a nonprofit, Everything ALS, 
as well as Critical Path Institute. And FDA itself has um, some divisions that are working with investigators to try to incorporate digital biomarkers into trials. To give you a sense of one of the ways that these promise to be um, uh, good additions to our traditional outcome measures, our traditional outcome measures really provide sparse data. So let's say we do a six month trial and see people every six, every month during that time, we'd have six data points on our primary outcome measure. So if somebody misses one visit, we're now missing almost 20% of our data. Using what we call active digital monitoring, that is asking people to fill out a survey or do a task or make a speech recording, we could easily ask people to do things every week and we get a much more robust data set that's more resilient to data that's missing. And when we move to what we call passive data monitoring, we get really large data sets. And this is looking at um, data that comes from sensors while people live their everyday life. So it could be a wearable or it could be data coming from sensors on a, on a phone. Um, and this is truly um, a remarkable change in the, in the size of data set that we get. That's, that's a benefit of passive data monitoring. But there is also something else that we have to be careful about with passive data monitoring, which is that we have voluminous data, it's highly variable, and it requires a lot of processing. And the algorithms that we use to process that become the main part of what we need to research because we need to have a huge amount of trust in our algorithm. So this is not raw GPS data, but it's unfiltered GPS data. And we, when we put that through an algorithm, we can see that here, um, the, the distance that people are traveling over time declines as the disease progresses. But we have to have a lot of confidence that that algorithm that we're using is doing its job correctly. And that's true of, of sort of all of passive data monitoring. So with all of this in mind, we set out to do a study, which turned into a series of studies that we called symptom monitoring for ALS in real time. And this um, uses something called the BWE smartphone app and data portal, which was designed at the School of Public Health by JP Onella. And BWE is a, um, an end-to-end -end encrypted, very secure platform for collecting both passive and active data on a cell phone. That data is collected and sent to the cloud where it's stored as raw data. And there is also a cloud processing uh, uh, forum that holds standard processing algorithms so that they can be applied to the raw data, applied to other data sets, um, and new processing algorithms can be added to this so that you can reprocess raw data. This allows us, which is very important in academia, to analyze uh, data and then to replicate those analyses with exactly the same parameters. But it also allows us to reanalyze data differently. And that's really important when we're generating these huge data sets because we get better and better ideas, and we've seen this happening over the years, about how to analyze this data. We did this on personal cell phones, so people put it onto their own cell phone. And we did that because personal cell phones present an opportunity. There is truly a condition called nomophobia, which is a fear of not having your cell phone with you. It's actually being considered for the DSM, but in a, in a very mild form, lots of us have it. Um, and and so as a result, people have their cell phones with them. So 90% of adults have their cell phone within arm's reach throughout the day. But not only that, smartphones are loaded with sensors, accelerometers, gyroscopes, GPS. And also we can ask people to do active data tasks on them. So fine finger movement tasks, cognitive tasks, speech recordings. Phones have remarkably good microphones built into them. And patient reported outcome measures can all be obtained. So we designed a study where we got ground truth data with sort of in-person data. Because of the pandemic, a lot of this is done by telephone, but the ALS FRSR delivered by an examiner done at uh, 0, 06, 12, and 24 weeks throughout the study. And then we got active app data. So we had baseline surveys, including one I'll tell you about in a moment called the Communicative Participation Item Bank, as well as the self-entry ALS FRSR. And we got weekly recordings of both speech, people reading a passage, a standard passage, and a voluntary cough or volitional cough recording. And then we also got all of the passive data from the phone. And this is, by the way, can be done on both Android and iPhone, which is unusual for, for programs and a real benefit. One of the criticisms that we got when we set out to do this was like something like GPS is a very blunt tool. Will it show you anything? And um, the world sort of provided us an opportunity to look at this because around the time of the COVID pandemic onset, we had about eight people with ALS using this program on their cell phones. And we just took a quick look. We said, look, the world has changed dramatically overnight. And if we can't pick up that relatively large change in behavior, then we're probably in trouble with GPS. But if we can, it's a good proof of concept. So it turns out that our group of people with ALS were spending about 19 hours a day at home prior to the onset of the pandemic. We used the state of emergency in the US as kind of a, a delineating line. After that, in the, in the just month or two after that, those same people were spending almost 24 hours a day at home. 
And so, you know, big change in behavior, we certainly can pick that up. It leaves the question, will this be useful and for, for more subtle change, like a change in behavior from ALS? Um, but I think it is a proof of concept. Now, there were some other large databases of just general population changes, and they saw a very similar absolute change in how much time people spent at home, but it went from 10 hours to 14 hours a day in that, in that sort of one month period. And so even though people were saying, oh my gosh, I'm never leaving my house, I'm never leaving my house, the reality is they were still spending less time at home than people with ALS were spending prior to the pandemic. Um, one of the benefits of, of BeWe and smartphones is that we can obtain uh, audio on that platform. And I've been working for many years with Jordan Green and Kate Conahan at the Institute of Health Professions at MGH. And they do very sophisticated motion capture and uh, studio recordings of audio to, to get at speech diagnostics and develop quantitative speech uh, parameters that may help us follow disease. And in ALS, um, it turns out that pause time in a red passage, so we have a standard passage called the bamboo passage, we have people read it, and the amount of time that they spend pausing is actually an accurate early diagnostic marker of vulvar onset of disease. So if we do this in people who have ALS, but do not complain of any vulvar symptoms, and we don't detect any vulvar symptoms, we can actually still separate them from healthy volunteers based on how much time they're, they're pausing. There are other parameters we can get out of this, like speaking rate, um, and articulation rate, which are also very useful parameters. In this uh, cohort, at least, pause time was the most uh, sensitive. We applied this in a trial some years ago of dextromethorphan and quinidine. Now, this is approved for pseudobulbar affect, but there was some thought that it may have an effect on speech as well. And applying these same parameters, we see this was a crossover trial. So there was an active period and a placebo period for everybody. They were randomized in what order they went in here. I've just separated them into active and placebo. But the percent pause time increased during treatment with placebo, but decreased during treatment with, uh, with uh, dexamethorphine and quinidine, suggesting that there is an effect of dexamethorphine and quinidine. In a more detailed analysis, it looked like there were some people who responded to this and some people who didn't. And I would just say clinically, that's sort of what it seems like, in clinic, that some people don't have much response, but a few people do. That improvement in percent pause time was really driven by longer speech segments and shorter pauses between those. So we can really even drill down into sort of why are we seeing this change when we have these really large quantitative uh, data sets. Now, that is all in a, in a highly controlled clinical setting, but we, we ported that over to use it on a smartphone and make recordings. And there were a lot of questions about this. Is background noise gonna be a problem? What about the microphone itself? Is it good enough? What about the fact that people can have this microphone close to them or far away from them? And that does limit some of the kinds of analyses that we can do. Um, but as far as sort of pause time or speaking rate, it actually has been very robust to this. And, and Jordan and, and Kate Conahan have been uh, really leaders in, in showing how we can clean up the data and do these analyses. And so we had people read a standard passage and we looked at their average pause duration, the total time they're not talking during that passage divided by the number of pauses. And that average pause duration increased in all but one of our participants in this pilot study, which was really encouraging and has been replicated in a number of analyses. And this really has led us to put this as a, an outcome measure into the platform trial and other trials, which is, which is really exciting. Now, Kate Conahan had the idea, and I think it's a very, very important one, that we might, one might look at this data and say, okay, so people are pausing more or they're speaking more slowly, but does that matter? And that I think is gonna be a response of the FDA if we went to them with the data that we have. So we incorporated this communicative participation item bank into our studies. And this is a 10 item questionnaire that asks, how do people use verbal communication with people they know, with people they don't know, for simple topics and for more complex topics? And what we found is that when people are speaking at a normal rate, there's sort of an agreed upon threshold, basically agreed upon threshold. Is anything really agreed upon in medicine? But basically agreed upon threshold of 150 words per minute as a normal speaking rate. If people are speaking at a normal rate, they rated their communicative participation as normal. But if they're speaking at a slowed speaking rate, most of those people rated their communicative participation as normal. And this, I think, imbues that quantitative data with a real clinical meaning and is remarkably important. So, Kate has much more data with this now and is working on, on a paper, which I think will be really important. We were also making cough recordings and looking at a cough audiogram. This is a volitional cough, so we asked people to cough. Um, and we thought, you know, cough uh, involves respiratory system and the bulbar system, and this may give us an insight into both of those systems. 
when we apply a machine learning model, it actually turns out that we do have a moderate accuracy, accuracy for detecting bulbar symptoms, but really not a very good accuracy at all for respiratory symptoms, which was a surprise to us, but I think is, you know, is an interesting finding. We want to validate this work with clinical perceptual rating. So basically having people listen to the cough and rate that cough. Um, and there are rating systems for cough that we can do that with, and we have a recording. So that, I think that's a, that's a good next step. We'd also like to improve the model. And Bridget Perry is in uh, Jordan Green's lab and is really working on this. But it raises the question, and we're only at the early part of this, and we have longitudinal data we have to look at, can volitional cough serve as a marker of bulbar impairment? And I, I think it's a, a really interesting idea. We can also use the same platform and other platforms to deliver traditional scales, but to be used as patient reported outcome measures. And so I told you that the, the ALSFRSR has to be delivered by an examiner, but the self entry ALSFRSR, just having people answer these questions on their phone, it turns out correlates very well with the examiner delivered or traditional ALSFRSR. We do have to note that the self entry scale is higher. So people rate themselves about 2.4 points higher, two and a half points higher than the examiner rates them. Um, but the correlation is incredibly high. Now, this is a pilot study. The next question that you have to ask is what happens over time? So we looked at the slope of the in-clinic ALSFRSR, the traditional one, and the, self, uh, the smartphone self-entry ALSFRSR. And it turns out that the mean rate of decline is actually remarkably similar between the two, certainly not statistically different. We get a lot more data for self-entry because we can ask more frequently. And the standard deviation as a result of smaller for the, the self-entry ALSFRSR. So I think that's incredibly encouraging as well. We wanted to replicate these results in a less savvy population. We were concerned that perhaps people who would enroll in a study like a digital biomarker study might be more familiar with research and know the scales. So we went to our clinic and we used the patient reported outcome measures that we do in clinic before people come into clinic, sort of as a standard part of our clinic. They're doing these outcome measures on an iPad, and then we had people come into clinic and we had the examiner deliver the ALS FRSR. And when, in this completely unselected population, when we uh, compare those two results, we see that there's a very high correlation. There's a little more spread to it. You see a few outliers, and I think that's something we have to accept with the self-entry scale, that there will be a few outliers. But um, the correlation is very high, and we see almost exactly the same offset. So people continue to rate themselves a little bit higher um, than the examiner rates themselves, but in, in a reliable way. We don't have as much longitudinal data from this, and I'm not showing it here, but um, it, you know, it showed decline uh, as well. Interestingly, when we look at this as a self-entry scale, we can get more information as well. So it turns out that lower ALSFRSR scales uh, scores correlate with a longer ALSFRSR completion time. Now, I don't think that this is probably a robust enough variable that it could be an outcome measure in clinical trials, the time to complete the survey, but it could be potentially a covariate. It also, I think, raises a really important question, which is, or, or point, which is that it, as the disease progresses, doing any of these outcome measures gets harder for people. And that uh, is, I think, important from a humanistic perspective. It's important for how we design trials. And it's also really important for digital outcome measures when we think about compliance. This is something that is not written about in digital medicine as much as it should be, but compliance is a real issue that we need to deal with in these digital outcome measures. So these are from three different studies using the BUI platform. Study one was a 12-week study, um, smart ALS study. We then went to a longer observational study with uh, about 100 people that we call study two here. And study three was a trial of inosine where we implemented this, a randomized controlled trial. So we saw very good compliance in study one. GPS, which is the only passive measure I'm showing, compliance was a little bit higher than the, the active uh, data collection but for audio and surveys. In study two, where we had more people, maybe a little bit less uh, kind of a vanguard, the early adopters, we saw that there was a, a steady drop off in compliance, which is actually better than what's published in the literature if you look closely, but still I think um, left us really saying, you know, we need to do more. I will also make the point that we did absolutely nothing to remind people about this. We put the app on their phone at a, at a visit, and then they just did whatever they were going to do with it. It had reminders that came to them. But we thought, you know, I think we can do better than this. And I'll show you some data about that. I think encouragingly, in the trial of innocent, we actually see very high compliance. Now, again, that's a shorter study. And maybe that when people have a shorter target, they do better. Interestingly, we also continued data collection for the safety period of 28 days after the end of the, of the treatment. And you see the compliance begin to drop off. So 
it's a it's a good thing I think that that we have some evidence that people will comply better in a trial setting than in an observational setting, and that's true I think for other biomarkers as well. But a lot we learned a lot from doing that, and I think it's really important for the field that we're honest about compliance. So the last smart study we did, we added a wearable component to this. So the remainder of the study is basically the same, and we added either for for participants either an ankle uh, worn uh, wearable called the stepwatch or an actigraph wrist worn wearable. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to show the actigraph data here, although they both did a very good job of, of counting steps. But what we found is that step count and activity count, which is sort of like a somewhat more sophisticated step count, both decline over time and correlate with the ALS FRSR. So you can see all the way on the left that the number of steps declines. Um, it's a hard, it's a broad scale, so we maybe should look at log steps so that it can spread out a little bit. Um, but those steps decline over time. We have to correct for non-wear time. So if people are less compliant over time, it will look like their steps are declining, but we do have ways to, to analyze that as well. Um, it turns out that was actually easier on the actigraph than the mode of step watch. And that's part of the reason I'm showing this data. If we compare it to the ALS FRSR, we see that as the ALS FRSR is lower, there are fewer steps as well. And that's true of total activity counts as well, which is, again, just a sort of a, a proxy for step count. Now, we also got actigraphy data from the smartphone itself. Um, this is a very different algorithm or pathway. It seems like they're counting the same thing. The truth is we're not actually counting continuously from the cell phones. Where there's a lot more in interpolation that has to happen. But we saw a very similar thing. First of all, using GPS, looking at home time, we see that people with lower ALS FRSR scores spend more time at home. We see that the distance that people travel is shorter when people have lower ALS FRSR scores. And then if we look at the log of activity index, which is um, an accelerometry based uh, a parameter, we see that people with lower scores have less activity. So with all of this in mind, we went into um, another study. This was with, uh, with a partner, Biogen. We called it the digital ALS study. The catchy name came from the coordinator, SMART. The digital ALS study, that came from me, um, <laughs> brute force. Um, but we provisioned phones to people we had a sort of highly curated user experience. Um, it was well resourced, so we had coordinators who could, who are many of whom are here actually, who could call participants and keep them involved in the study and give them reminders. And we were really focused on active data collection for this study primarily. So the the basic outline of it was, um, it was a 25 week study. It was observational. There were three visits that were phone visits at baseline, halfway through, and at the end. And people were doing these digital assessments uh, um, every week throughout. And we had 19 people with ALS and 23 healthy volunteers. So the kind of things that we were asking people to do were patient reported outcome measures, cognitive assessments, which I think we have some more work to do on, to be honest. And I'm not going to present those results. Um, but I think mainly what we learned is we need to revamp our cognitive assessments, um, speech recordings fine motor or dexterity measures, and walking and balance tests. So the first thing to say is that compliance in this study was much, much better. And I think that is testament to the fact that people want to do this right, but they need reminders throughout it. And this was a lot of work for our coordinators. Um, they had to track in real time what compliance was like and make some calls to remind people. Um, but I think this is a, a good sign for the future that we know how to do this. The other thing to say is that the traditional and self-entered ALS FRSR again correlate very highly. Again, people rated themselves a little bit higher, not quite as much higher here, about a point and a half, but still very high correlation. And then we looked over time and we saw a very similar story to what I showed you before, which is that we have much more data, but the, the trajectories look very similar. And what I show on the right-hand side is that the point estimate, excuse my pointer, the point estimate of the rate of decline of ALS FRSR is actually really consistent across traditional every three months and, and the, the digital measures. Now, what we did is artificially subtract some of those measures and say, okay, we gave it weekly, but what if we only look at every other? What if we only look at once a month? Or what if we look at every three months? And what we see is that even though the point estimate is the same, the confidence interval goes down as we ask more frequently so that we have a, a, a lower confidence interval, smaller confidence interval, um, for, for weekly examinations with ALS, ALS FRSR than we do for the, the three month, even though it's traditional. That means more statistical power in a trial, and we, we could leverage that. The other thing that I would say in looking at this is that there is a little bit of the law of diminishing returns if we look at every two weeks compared to every one week. So yes, we do get a smaller confidence interval, but it's not very much smaller. So it might be reasonable to ask people to fill this out every two weeks and, and get additional power. 
Now, behind loss of strength, fatigue is the second most common complaint from people with, with ALS about their symptoms. And um, the neurological fatigue index for motor neuron disorders was developed by Carolyn Young in the UK. We applied that in this study. And what we found, um, which is consistent with what people tell us, is that people with ALS compared to healthy volunteers had much higher levels of fatigue. And you can see that in the summary subscale, weakness subscale, and the energy subscale. And I think, you know, you also see that some people who are healthy volunteers have fatigue. Some of these people are caregivers for people with ALS, and that might explain it, but some people are just, just have fatigue. That's not surprising. I think it would be surprising if we didn't see some of that overlap. But I think it highlights how important this is. The next question we ask ourselves, again, is what happens longitudinally? And it turns out that actually there is a slope to this, the fatigue increased over time. And so this may be a measure that we want to monitor for drugs to see if we can have an impact on fatigue. And we're doing some I'm not going to present them today, but some studies to try to uncover what is the sense of fatigue versus muscle weakness versus the fatigue of muscles. And we have a study using digital assessments to bring people into the office to try to get at the connection between those or, or dissociation between those. Now, we also thought that mood might affect this, um, this uh, fatigue scale. So we looked at that and we, there may be a small effect, but certainly not statistically significant. We also looked at morning versus midday versus evening. When did people take the scale? suspecting that if they took it in the evening, they would report more fatigue. It actually turns out that they report more fatigue midday, um, though whether that, and, and in fact, evening versus midday is statistically significant, but barely. And I think, you know, having more people would be, would be interesting. But I think, you know, that's actually reassuring to say it's not changing dramatically based on when they take it or what their mood is. We looked again at speaking rate, and this correlates with the ALS FRSR ball bar subscale. And one thing I wanted to point out here is the y-axis is the speaking rate in words per minute. The color is the max pause time. And you can see that those two things are really highly correlated. So that lower on the, on the axis, um, that is slower speaking, correlates with a higher pause rate. But also um, that we do see this decline in speaking rate as people report um, more dysfunction on the ball bar subscale. A finger tapping composite score that is total taps um, and the time between taps correlates with the ALS FRSR fine motor subscale. We want to look at this over time. We haven't yet done that. But I think this is really tantalizing evidence that fine, we, we may have measures to quantify fine motor, fine motor movements as well. And then finally, we looked at gait speed. And overall, gait speed does correlate with ALS FRSR gross motor subdomain. You'll see how the healthy volunteers um, kind of are over at the 12. There's a fairly big spread there. Interestingly, we see a fairly stable sort of from, from 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 on that subscale, we see a fairly stable gait speed, and then it begins to, to decline below that. But the pink dots are pe people using walking aids, and our, our algorithms really are not set up for, for people using uh, walking aids. They're not validated in that population. So I think we have some more work to do on this as sort of an active task. Um, and, and that's okay. That's one of the things you learn in these early studies. Now, we've been working with a small company called NQ Medical on a different way of looking at fine finger movement. So NQ Medical has a way of exploring and quantifying fine finger movements, and that is that they store and analyze the characteristics of how people type, but not the content of what they type from a smartphone or virtual keyboard. So just like you can add a different a keyboard for a different language or swipe keyboard on your cell phone, this is a research keyboard that you add and you can select using that. And so participants put this keyboard onto their cell phone and they type on it and it records things like, how long do people press on the letter? How long does it take them to go to the next letter? How close to the center of the letter do they type? How often do they use the backspace? And then there's a, they develop algorithms and these algorithms already can distinguish Parkinson's from controls and on states from off states of Parkinson's. And so we wanted to see if we could do a similar thing in that class. And indeed, um, we can see that that using uh, the NQ, what we call the NQ index, which is sort of the, the number that comes out of this algorithm, we can differentiate ALS from healthy controls to quite a high degree. Now, some people with ALS don't have much fine finger uh, abnormality, um, so you know it doesn't completely separate, but it's at least as good as any of our biofluid biomarkers. Um, high sensitivity specificity. We did an alternate alternating finger tap in this study as well, and that did not have nearly the sensitivity. In fact, not good sensitivity at all for separating healthy controls and, and people with ALS. Then we focused on the ALS group and we asked, does the NQ index correlate with ALS FRSR as we've done before? There is a correlation. This is the total ALS FRSR score. We wouldn't expect 100% correlation here, but I think on, on, on the face of it, it is encouraging that, there's a, that there is a, a 
correlation. And then we, again, look longitudinally. So what we did here was took our group of people, and this is an interim analysis. We actually have our final data set now. So the coordinators um, did their final visit with the final participant just uh, last week, I think. Um, but in this interim analysis, we took the group of people who had longitudinal data, we divided them based on the rate of decline of their ALS FRSR. So that in green, you see the slow progressors and, and in red, the fast progressors. And then we just calculated the slope for those two groups. And because that's how we made our groups, clearly there's a separation in those two slopes. What we wanted to do then is apply the NQI and say, does the NQI have a different slope of decline amongst slow progressors and fast progressors for the total ALS FRSR? And indeed, we do see a difference. So what one might look at this and say, well, look, the separation is more on the ALS FRSR, which is, that's a better scale. But the reality is we made our groups based on the ALS FRSR. So there has to be more separation there. That's how this works. But this does show if we have a slow group and a fast group, we can detect that using the, the NQI. And so if we had a trial that slowed progression, we would end up with a slow group and a fast group, and it would look something like this. And I think that's very encouraging. So I'm really looking forward to the final analysis from this. I want to turn my attention briefly now from using, from developing markers that really fit nicely, I think, into clinical trials if, if we get to, you know, get, get a little more data on them, to a little more what do we, maybe we'll say out there sort of an idea, which is, can we use internet search data to identify people with ALS? And I understand that this is a, that, that this is a sort of a um, unusual question. It really comes from the fact that there is this long diagnostic delay that has been stubborn. We have been, had a hard time reducing that diagnostic delay. We've embarked on various projects to look at charts very closely or use natural language processing for medical records that have not really yielded good results. And part of the reason for that is we're looking, all, we're looking at the same data that we have in front of us anyway. So what, what I thought is, you know, maybe we could look at data that is not a part of a, our health system. Maybe there's a, a, a data trail that would lead us to understand somebody was developing ALS. And um, I got laughed out of a lot of rooms when I sort of said that, probably appropriately so, but eventually Ernest Frankel, who's at MIT said, you know, actually I have a friend who's working on this at Microsoft Research this kind of thing, and, and he would be a good collaborator. And this comes from Ilad Yamtov. Um, the idea is that, you know, look, we're putting trillions of data points into the, the internet at any given time. And that is a completely new source of data, and we can, we can fund that for uh, medical purposes. And he actually had already done work saying, you know, search engines can track uh, real life events. So he looked at pregnancy. And early in pregnancy, people are searching for things like late period, faint line pregnancy tests. In mid pregnancy, they're looking for clothes, bedding, shower. And at the end, they're asking questions like into, into labor, water broke, the newborn. And so this is, I think, really a proof of concept that we can use data from search engines to inform us about medical events. So we did a retrospective study using existing search data and we identified cases and controls. Now, the ALS cases we defined as basically people who told their search engine, I have ALS. They had to type into their search engine, I've been diagnosed with ALS, or, or I have been diagnosed with ALS. You know, we had to come up with this, but it's basically this statement. Now, someone might type that in and not have ALS. I understand. That. So this is not a ground truth, but it gets us, I think, at least a proof of concept. And in fact, if there are lots of people telling their search engine, I have ALS, when they don't, that will bias us toward a null hypothesis and we wouldn't find anything. We then identified controls who had similar queries overall to the cases, um, but did not tell their, their search engine that they had ALS. And we had 50 controls for every case. And then we used AI to differentiate the cases from controls based on their search data. Now, for privacy reasons, we could not look at the content of their search engines, except for what we called ALS related queries. So we came up with a list of queries that people with ALS might be looking for. For example, really is all, Adara bone, uh, fasciculations, and we had a long list of these. And then we had to look at search behavior. So things like how long were sessions and how often was autocorrect uh, um, used. We had 200, we identified 285 ALS users. Those users had on average over the period, we looked at nine queries per day. And they averaged 22 ALS-related queries over that time. It was a two-week period. It may have been a four-week period. And we had 3,276 control users. They averaged many more queries, 48 queries per day. And on average, they only looked for 0.6 ALS-related queries. But interestingly, 
There were about 400 of them that looked for an average of four of those ALS queries, and the rest looked for none. So there was sort of a, a dichotomous population in the control zone. So this shows some of the ways that people with ALS differ from controls in their search behavior. Um, people with ALS had used autocorrect more, and the ALS group also use more rare queries, which is, which is interesting. We don't know exactly what the content of this is, just that they're rare uh, queries. Our power to distinguish ALS from controls was actually really quite robust. The AUC was in the range of, not, of 0.9. And the four most critical variables were session duration, autocorrect, query likelihood, and whether that query was used by fewer than five users in the data set, so ultra-rare queries. There are three lines on this ROC, and the reason is that we, we looked at three different epochs. So we, we looked at sort of two weeks or a month, and then a year later, two weeks or a month, and a year after that, two weeks or a month, thinking that it may be easier and easier to distinguish people with ALS from controls as the disease progressed. But it turns out, actually, it was, it was probably equally simple at any of these times which is interesting, it, asks, it sort of begs the question, would this be an early diagnostic? I wanna be careful about that. Would this be an early way to potentially identify people with ALS? It is really not about coming up with a diagnostic tool and I don't wanna to go to sort of dystopian places with this. The real point here is, can we use uh, data sets that we don't traditionally use in medicine to explore health? Now, to follow up on a retrospective study, because of some of the weaknesses that I talked about, we did a small prospective cohort and to, to replicate those findings. So we developed a website where people could consent, fill out a brief survey about ALS, and then link that survey to their, to their search results, their search history, without us ever knowing who the person is. Um, so we could do this anonymously. There were 120 people, 122 people went to the website, 85 consented, 60 completed the questionnaire. Of those, 45 reported that they had ALS. And this is a Microsoft project, so Microsoft research project, so we were using Bing. So only 16 of them had Bing data. So we had a very small group of, of cases. Um, uh, um, and then we matched them to 3,750 control users. And we used the model, we didn't build a new model, we didn't tweak the model, we used exactly the model that we had built for the retrospective case uh, control study and applied that here and we still got a very good AUC. And I think we could have run this longer, um, it was really a matter, became a matter of resources, um, but even in a small perspective study, we could still separate people from ALS and controls. Again, um, I think the question becomes, could data like this reduce diagnostic delay for ALS? Is there some way that that could happen? I don't want to, again, it's not so much a use case that I'm saying we ought to, oh, we ought to be diagnosing people like this, but rather there is a lot of data out there that we're not using for health that we could be. And I'll just say that, um, you know, we've had meetings with grocery stores because they collect a lot of data about us and people with ALS change their eating habits over time. There's some complications to using that data, but, you know, there are these large data sets that we just don't think about that may have some use in, in health. In fact, diabetes actually, um, some diabetes programs are using grocery store uh, data to, to understand that disease. But if we really want to get at understanding the early parts of this disease, we need to be creative. And so that's one idea, but I think a more concrete idea is a study that we call Prevent ALS. And Mark Array is here. He's really, um, this was started by Katie Nicholson. Mark Array is really taking this into his hands and, and driving it forward. The idea is to identify the earliest biological and clinical changes due to ALS and pre-symptomatic gene carriers. So we have a population of people that really may develop, will develop disease, may develop disease, or has a high likelihood of developing disease. And we can sort of follow them before they have disease and see what happens first. So the design of this prevent ALS study, and, and very briefly, is that we identify an at-risk person, that is somebody who comes from a family with known genetic ailments. We consent them, they can choose to be in what we call the disclosure group or the non-disclosure group. The disclosure group means that they want to know their own gene status and non-disclosure means they do not. There's a lot of talking that goes into understanding this for the, for the participant. We take that very seriously. We do a screening exam in history to make sure that they don't have ALS um, and that they are pre-symptomatic truly. And then we test for the ALS causative disease genes and we return those results. Very, very uh, difficult visits uh, or at least highly emotional, or we don't return the results if they're in the non-disclosure group. And then we collect outcome measures every six to 12 months. And those include blood and spinal fluid biomarkers, quantitative strength testing, ALS FRSR, quantitative motor speech analysis, sometimes an EMG and, and many other things. We do these in clinic and we do it every six to 12 months. 
Now, prevent ALS is actually a combination of two studies, the DIAL study that we've been doing for many years with, MG, with MGH and WashU, where we have over 200 participants and, and almost 10 converters, that is people who have gone from pre-symptomatic to symptomatic, and the family study, which is being run at Columbia University, very similar design, and we're aligning those studies. They have 148 participants. So by joining forces, we automatically essentially double our power in the study, and we'd like to expand from here. But there are some challenges for prevent ALS. There's a low incidence of genetic ALS, about 15% of all ALS, and people are not clustered in one location, but spread throughout the country. There's no readily identifiable prodrome as there is in Parkinson's with REM sleep behavior disorder. There's, the gene mutations are not associated with a specific age of onset in most cases, as we see in Huntington's disease. And there's a lack of specific biomarkers for early disease, which is why we're doing the study. So we don't really know when to focus our monitoring. So we just sort of see people at regular intervals, but it has to be relatively infrequent. People are healthy, they're living their lives. They're, they may be coming from far away. That's a challenge because onset of clinical weakness is easy to miss if we're doing annual visits. It's you know, very unlikely it's gonna happen that day. So um, there is a real role for digital biomarkers in this study, I think, because we can do frequent, easy monitoring that would help us identify conversion in real time, and then we could bring people in in real time to assess their symptoms. And so I think that's a, a real opportunity for digital biomarkers in this study. So I'll conclude by just saying that digital data is giving us new ways to deliver existing and novel PROs and generating new types of quantitative data and new insights into ALS progression. Active data requires participant effort, um, but is focused and analysis can be straightforward. Passive data can yield, yield these very large data sets, but requires um, really intensive processing. The benefit is it can be analyzed in numerous ways to give novel insights into functioning. I have one more slide after this, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, that in just a moment. Um, quantitative motor speech analysis is actually quite mature, and it's providing quantitative measures of all of our function. We're already putting it into clinical trials. Cough analysis is newer, but really might quantitate vulvar disease progression. Digital endpoints themselves can, I think, improve ALS trial design, and we've begun to put them into trials. And attention to the usability, the burden, and compliance is critical to success. Now, I've sort of talked a lot about compliance for people in the studies, participants, but I think we have to think a lot about coordinators because they have busy jobs running a trial as well as project managers who are running multi center studies. If we don't get all of those parties on board, then these are destined to fail in our trials. So I think we need to really take a, a, a deep look at what do each of those parties need in order to make this successful. And then lastly, there are huge troves of data that are completely unmined for ALS and neurology research. And I would just say, think, let's think creatively about it. So our future directions include sharing existing data to find powerful new analyses. So uh, Anupam Gupta, um, close colleague in, in some of these studies, showed us an analysis of accelerometry data, not actually from our studies, but from a group called ALS-TDI the other day, looking at sub-movements, which was remarkable and I think incredibly exciting. Uh, Martin S., we'll call him, is a postdoc at J.P. Onella's lab at the Harvard School of Public Health and is doing an analysis of arm movements using our accelerometry data from, from Actigraph that is remarkable and paints a very incredible picture of how things change over time for arm movements, not so much step counts. We want to study new and emerging best-in-class devices, so we're starting a new project with colleagues in Belgium uh, and a company called Cisnav that makes a wearable device. They, were, they actually made the guts for guided missiles and then shrunk those down so that we could use them as a medical device. They actually have their first, they have their first EMA, their, the first EMA approval for a secondary endpoint in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, looking at stride velocity. And we want to create ways to incorporate these digital endpoints into trial seamlessly, which I, which I just talked about. But on the platform trial, we have a biomarkers and outcomes working group where we can kind of vet some of these, some of which are not ready to go into the trial. But then the good ones we can bring to the design team and say, you know, this is really important. We should put this in. And that's how, you know, that, that's how I think we're going to make progress. And we want to incorporate and adapt our digital approach into the prevent study. And the one thing I didn't really say is that an approach to healthy participants may be slightly different than an approach to people with ALS. There may be different tolerances for how frequently we ask them questions, kinds of things we ask them to do. Um, and so we, we need to really be careful about how we do. This work is done in collaboration with lots of wonderful colleagues. So um, JP Onella, I've mentioned a number of times, is at the Onella lab at the Harvard School of Public Health. He built BWE. He is a partner in analyzing that. It's just been a lot of fun to work with him, and he's had wonderful postdocs. 
um, who have worked on these projects. Jordan Green and Kate Conahan have been longtime collaborators on these projects and many others. And I just value that collaboration very much. It's been, I think, over a decade I've been working with Jordan Green. My colleagues at the MJ Chile Center um, merit as a mentor to me, but uh, Sabrina, Suma, Doreen, Mark, and Stephen Johnson, who was a fellow here last year. This is one of the most fulfilling parts of my job is working with these people. Anne-Marie Wills um, is, uh, uh, she and I have worked on a few projects together using Tuck. She is really inspiring because she just doesn't sort of take no and she's just unafraid to try something new. She's using many of these uh, measures in movement disorders and it's just been fun to have somebody to kind of compare notes with along the way. We have incredible operations team, data management systems, project management, who allow us to do studies like the PREVENT study and some of these other multi-center studies that I've talked about. I wanna mention our industry partners for some of these MT Pharma Holdings uh, of America, Biogen and, and Q Medical. Everything ALS is a nonprofit, which has really taken on doing some of these digital studies in a big way. Um, and I'm on their scientific board of advisors, uh, which is in my disclosures, but I think they're really doing an interesting job of taking some of these early findings and, and thinking about the regulatory pathway. Ernest Frankel and Divya Ramamurthy have been wonderful collaborators. We have coordinators, many of whom are here, who have worked on these projects diligently, and that's the only reason that we've got there, and nurses and nurse practitioners at the Healy Center. And I want to take a special moment to talk about Katie Burke, who is a physical therapist. And Katie has been a partner on all of these projects, as well as the many projects that didn't make it to slides because they didn't work or they're not done yet. Um, and um, never deserved by failure. Uh, I think our first project was the Microsoft Connect project. We said, well, look, if you can use it for video games, you can use it to understand ALS. And that's not true. Um, <laughs> Uh, it also turns out it's not that great for video games. They've stopped producing it. So, um, but but in all seriousness, Katie is um, just remarkable. She knows more about digital endpoints uh, in ALS than probably anybody else in the world. And I want to thank her deeply for for all of her help and, and camaraderie through all of this. Thank you very much. Well, congratulations on uh, Spani awarding your leadership at this area of the global. I'm just kind of curious where you see this eventually coming into care, or like what's kind of the path? Yeah, so Merritt asked the question, do I see this coming into clinical care? And, and um, I think that's a, a great question. And I didn't, I, I sort of said at the outset, I'm not going to focus on this so much. I do think that there's a role for this in clinical care. And actually, motor speech analysis is probably the most advanced of all the things that I talked about. We are working with Stacey Sullivan in our clinic now to begin making recordings in clinic and doing some of these very simple analyses that are really at the level of clinical care. So words per minute, we can track that quantitatively over time in clinical care. And it may actually tell us something about when to get people involved with augmentative communication. It may also correlate with vulvar function in a way that we can say, oh, at this point, we need to get involved and have a, a swallow study on somebody You know, when words per minute fall below a certain threshold. So, that's an example, but I think that there are, there are lots of ways that we can do this. Katie is also working actually on a very simple protocol. It remains research at this point, but to use um, some accelerometers in the clinic, basically, to see whether that will inform our, our, our physical therapy care at all. So I really do think that there's a way. I'd like to think that there's a way to use them for diagnostics. So someone comes in for your first visit, you give them some device, they go home with it, and a month later you have you know really meaningful data about how they're moving that might tell you about diagnosis. Jim, I, I do want to acknowledge that we have almost 80 people connected online in addition to a school room here, which is wonderful. And we have a few questions online. Yeah, so sure. real quick, can you comment on the challenges in cognitive assessment via digital? Yeah, yes. I can. So um, I think there are two challenges. And the first one, I just have to bring a little humility, which is to say I'm not a cognitive neuroscientist. And that may be the biggest problem. Um, <laughs> Having said that, you know, um, in the Biogen, in the study we did with Biogen, um, the digital ALS study, you know, we did work with with um, people who were who were really cognitive scientists. One of the challenges was that we took paper and pencil um, tasks and we put them onto a smartphone. So things like trails A and B, 
And it's not that they didn't work, they did, but this, what we think is that the space on the phone is much smaller. And so it's actually easier to do. And so we just didn't get as clear a separation as we thought we might based on results from paper and a pencil tests. And then the last thing is that there are cognitive changes in ALS. They tend to be associated with frontotemporal um, cognitive change. It's only dimension mention about 5% of people. It's subclinical and a larger percentage of people. But how we get at those subtle changes is a, a bit of a challenge. In I know we're almost out of time, but we have two more questions. Um, for digital biomarkers that aren't obviously functionally important, like speech pauses, how do you make the argument to use them as outcomes? Is it enough to show correlation with traditional measures? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we have showed correlation with traditional measures like ALS to SR, but remember ALS to SR has one question about speech. And so that's not a, it's not a very robust comparison. And that's where um, Kay Conahan's idea of using this more robust PRO about communicative participation, I think comes in. So we can say, okay, the pause, uh, percent pause time, uh, the speaking rate correlates with an inability to participate in life using verbal communication or a challenge with using verbal communication. I think that's how we begin to make that case. Last online question. Uh, to follow on Merit's question, can you identify subsets of patients, unique phenotypes that might inform a personalized medicine view of ALS? Yeah, this is a really this is a really interesting question. I think um, you know we've said that the disease can begin in the vulvar region, in the cervical region, the lumbar region, or respiratory, very occasionally generalized to. And so I think when I think about how we might use digital measures to look at subtypes, I think about these clinical subtypes, people who have just vulvar symptoms or just cervical, you know, arm symptoms or just leg symptoms, and how those uh, symptoms are spreading. And I think actually, if we could quantify that, it would tell us something even new about the disease. So, you know, we have a hard time predicting how the disease will progress, but maybe there are tells in, in more quantified digital data that says if something is progressing this way in one region, but not spreading to another region, that's a good sign they'll have slow progression. Or if the disease is spreading even subtly from one region to another, we can predict maybe rapid progression. So I think we could subset people and also learn something from that kind of analysis. That was all for online questions. I don't know. Uh, I think now we are out of. Oh, we have one more well, question. Well, Jane, if you put your Elon Musk hat on for a second and thought about how you could deploy this more widely, you know, even asking a Alexa to put Siri to the probably a lot of things are already in the online. I'm not going to do that. Not that you can apply the whole population and then say, is it early, you know, in the last uh, somebody? On that trajectory, or for Alzheimer's, you need to get anybody's friend. It seems like this would yeah. be a great framing for study. I, I love this. So I love this question. The question is, um, can we first put on my Elon Musk hat? I'm gonna, let's put on the hat more the suitcase of money. I like that. <laughs> Um, but I, but put on the Elon Musk hat, think big, could this go to sort of a population-based uh, kind of analysis for, you know, ALS, but also maybe Alzheimer's or, or, you know, common diseases? And what about using something like Alexa? And and actually, I mean, I have had some meetings with um, folks at Amazon over the years, as well as people with, at, at Apple. I think there are some privacy concerns. It's very interesting that we are, you know, we're very happy to use our data. And this is actually true. I would say this is true in my experience as well. People are happy to use their data to uh, sort of get targeted ads. They're more, they're more uncomfortable about a physician getting that data. I think in part, I've thought a lot about this because it doesn't, it sort of doesn't make a lot of logical sense, but it makes a little bit of emotional sense. Um, and I think part of that is that when you think, okay, there's going to be a physician looking at this data, that's you can picture that person looking at your data and somehow learning something about you. Whereas, you know, if it's going into the cloud and somebody's selling you, you know, green pants because of whatever you searched, you know, that's, that seems sort of fine and, and amorphous. The reality is when we talk about analyzing big data sets, nobody's sitting down and looking at, you know, what that, that search was for or where a person's going to time. So I, I think some of that, it can be waylaid. Um, but I actually do think that there is going to be a move into this and, and there will be privacy parameters put around it, and there'll be sort of opt-in programs. And I think these far-field microphones, like what's in Amazon Alexa or Hello Google or whatever, um, really will have a use. Yeah. Thank you, James. Thank you.